evening, everyone. My name is Abby Mahoney, and I am the student CEO of the Marlin Business Conference, A Greener Tomorrow. On behalf of the principals of management class, I would like to thank all, for all of you for taking the time to come here tonight, even if it was just for the free food. <laughs> I would also like to take a second to thank everyone who helped make this week possible, including Kennedy Soliday, Torin greenfield Tuthill, the principals of management class, specifically the tech team. Thank you, Daniel. Um, everyone's favorite professor, Frank Fatima, and a huge thank you to Dr. Malcolm for all of her help. I also wanted to thank President Miller and Dr. Larkin for giving me the opportunity to represent Virginia Wesleyan University, as well as gain experience in project management and event planning. Lastly, thank you to the City of Virginia Beach for their generous sponsorship. As we all know, this conference is serving as a precursor to the celebration of Earth Day, April 22nd. This week, we are aiming to focus on the importance of environmental consciousness through the perspective of the business world. Our keynote speaker has dedicated his career to maintaining accountability to the environment, even while striving for, for profitability, excuse me. He has served as the Director of Environmental Policy and Compliance at the, Virgin, at the Port of Virginia since 2015. Prior to joining the port, he earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Geology and his Master's in Urban Studies, both from ODU, but we've forgiven him since then. <laughs> It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Scott Whitehurst to the podium. Thank you, Abby. I appreciate it. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with you guys this evening. I, gosh, it's probably been, uh, I don't know, a few months since I've spoken in public, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. But <clears throat> I got to tell you, I think this is really my first keynote speech I've ever done. There was this other speech one time, but it wasn't called a keynote. So we're going to call this the first keynote speech I've ever done to kick off your event here. It's a great, really great layout. And I'll tell you, I don't think I've ever uh, been to a reception or the beginning of a conference um, that was not a focus of the environmental field in which there are so many great questions about what I do and about what the port's doing. And so that's really uh, you know, a credit to you guys and your passion for what you're doing here. And uh, so thank you for that. So let's get rolling a little bit. I'm not sure I can figure this device out. Sometimes they give me trouble, but I'll tell you, it's been <clears throat> a little over 20 years I've been working in the environmental field in this area. Uh, we. Um, We've been lucky enough at the Port of Virginia to, not long ago, having hired a new CEO. It's very, very forward thinking and forward leaning in regards to the environmental field and our sustainability initiatives at the port. That's really given me the power to do what I love to do. Um, so let's take a look at Oh, there it is. All right, so this is a graph that we came up with about a year and a half ago. Up to about a year and a half ago, my job as an environmental director at the Port of Virginia was, uh, what I'll say is quite similar to a lot of environmental jobs in Hampton Roads. What we focused on as an environmental director, managers, and I only have one other staff person who's an environmental specialist. We focused prior to our decarb effort and establishing that sprint event was on inspections. It was on our environmental management system and the manage of, management of that. It was uh, a strong focus of water quality, wetlands, as well as mitigation from construction projects that we had ongoing uh, and planned. And a year and a half or so ago, that all changed when we started talking about decarbonizing the port. But one thing you have to realize is that we have really been decarbonizing the port for many years. We didn't even call it decarbonization, you know, over a decade ago. We just called it reducing pollution. <laughs> And specifically, we were looking at criteria pollutants, things like NOx, SOx, particulate matters, things that make people not feel so great or irritate certain 
ailments that they have like asthma or other breathing issues. So we had started those, uh, wow, really over a decade ago with one of our earlier programs, which was a green operator program. The green operator program is a program where we have uh, grant dollars. We give uh, those grant dollars to local truck drivers to buy cleaner trucks with, uh, and they serve our facilities. We also operate a barge program, and we've operated a barge that runs from Hampton Roads to Richmond for many years, well over 20. And <clears throat> every cargo box that you'll see on that barge is one truck that doesn't drive up the I-64 or the 58 corridor or the 460 corridor. In 2016, we moved approximately between 16 and 17,000 containers via barge from Hampton Roads to Richmond. Last year, we moved over 42,000 containers by barge uh, using the James River. So those are just a couple of our really early initiatives that we had. After that, we started, well, we started looking into what other people were doing. People like Long Beach, and LA and some of the Northwest Seaport alliances. Those ports um, are today and, and have been for many years subject to regulations that we really at this time do not have to deal with here in Virginia. And we wanna keep it that way. And we wanna keep it that way by doing the right thing uh, before being asked to do it. So <clears throat> for uh, about six months or so, we worked on that glide slope, and what the glide slope was was basically saying, hey, we're not going to have any emissions at, by 2040, net zero by 2040. And that's in scope one and scope two emissions. If you don't know what scope one and two is, well, scope one is emissions from the equipment you own. Scope two is emissions from the power you use. And scope three, which we haven't talked about at all yet, but scope three is simply emissions from your supply chain partners. And that'll be kind of important in a little while. We'll talk about that a little more. But these are some of the um, initiatives and goals that we had set a little over a year ago when we started our first sprint activity to decarbonize our facilities. And so out of that came, here's what we want to do, 65% reduction in absolute emissions from 2017. The reason we picked 2017 is because we had good data for 2017. <clears throat> You'll figure out that having knowledge of what, what's at your facilities is important if you want to decarbonize. Um, we said, hey, we're going to power our, uh, our facilities with clean energy, and we're going to ensure that um, everything on our scope one and two side is net zero by 2040. And I'm really proud to say that we're well on our way to that goal. Um, here's some things about greenhouse gas emissions. I don't really know that you guys need to be able to really see or read any of this, but here's the big takeaway is that there's a lot of sources of greenhouse gases. And one big source is obviously in industrialization and what's the byproducts of combustion? greenhouse gases. So anywhere where we're driving diesel equipment or we're driving gasoline equipment, we're always going to have emissions associated with that. Those are the emissions that we're trying to curb on site as well as through our uh, power uh, partners at Dominion. <clears throat> so here's some more examples of what you might find uh, tied to scope one, two, and three emissions. We've already really talked a little bit about that. So what's really more interesting is how we're doing it. This is uh, one of our facilities. This is Virginia International Gateway. Virginia International Gateway, uh, when it was built in the early 2000s, was the most advanced terminal in North America. Uh, since the terminal was built, it has been expanded. And essentially, this entire area that you see here was a big green space in the middle of the terminal. About seven years ago, we started expanding our stack yard, which is what that area is called, stack yard. We also added rail capability that you'll see on the right side of the photo. We extended our wharf 
which you can't really see in this photo, but it allows us now to have three ULCVs. ULCV is an ultra large container vessel. It means that it can carry at least 12,000 TEUs. Anybody know what a TEU is? I'm getting, I'm getting real lingo-y on you. TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit, and it's how the shipping industry measures how many boxes that they move. So <clears throat> if you have a 12,000 TEU ship, that means it has 12,000 20-foot boxes on it, or, or maybe a combination of some 20-yard uh, and, and some 40-yard boxes as well. We also, in these stacks, as well as the ship to shore cranes, the big cranes you see along the water on the wharf, are all electric. Uh, they're also um, guided by some pretty sophisticated software. That software enables those stacks to be groomed, if you will, at night. And these cranes that you see here, the smaller ones, in the stacks, there's two in each row. And they move up and down the stacks all night long, positioning boxes for the customer the next day. So when the customer, truck driver, makes a reservation, makes a reservation on his phone, he knows when he has to come pick his box up. His box is waiting for him and ready to go. And it's really why we have become probably the most efficient port in North America and uh, we have the best turn times in North, or North America. So you know what a turn time is, is essentially when your truck hits the gate and you go pick your box up and then you leave the gate. We have the fastest in the United States. I'll tell you why that's important. Everybody's probably set somewhere in Hampton Roads behind someone idling. And, and you know, I didn't always have air conditioning in my car. You gotta keep the windows down sometimes. It gets hot and, and all you can smell is emissions. Well, uh, you know, the great thing is, is that this is what we're working to curb. This was how we started off. Uh, besides it, a couple of the programs I talked to you about, how we started off decarbonizing our equipment. Scope one is what we're talking about. Our equipment consists of pieces of big equipment that move boxes around the terminal. They kind of look like uh, you're on the Star Wars or something. They ride around and they, they pick the box up and they go to where the box needs to go and they drop it off. So <clears throat> these are all hybrid units, believe it or not. These hybrid units were actually something that we studied about eight years ago. We studied it coming out of Long Beach and they had done a, a pilot and a big write-up, really, a giant report. And I stole everything out of that report I could. And so I said, hey, why don't we try to get some funding to try out some of these hybrid shuttle carriers? And we said, okay. So we used, we're lucky enough, to get DERA funding. We used DERA funding, D-E-R-A, Diesel Emission Reduction Act funding. So we got a couple million dollars there to play around with on a three-unit pilot on hybrid shuttle carriers. Hybrid shuttle carriers are anywhere from 90 to 92 percent cleaner than us running a tier two diesel equivalent. So just by us swapping out that piece of equipment, number one, we save about 49 to 50 percent in fuel consumption. And because we get that fuel consumption savings, that's where you get the emissions savings as well. The motors in these things um, and the batteries that are associated with them also have the capability, kind of like uh, in a Prius or something, when you brake, it has regenerative braking, and then when you lower the box down, it also regenerates the battery. So we can run these things at our largest container terminals all day long, a whole lot cleaner, a lot less fuel used than what we were doing eight years ago. We run about a hundred of these units between our two largest container terminals. Um, and we're only about 10 units away from finishing the full sale uh, completion of that line of equipment. So that's a big accomplishment for us. You're probably thinking to yourself, oh, what's next at the Port of Virginia? Well, here's what's next. 
Um, these are fully electric UTRs. Now these trucks come by a, a bunch of different names depending on the industry you work in. I won't say all the names. Some of them aren't super appropriate. But <clears throat> this particular unit here is um, fully electric. It charges overnight. It can run for about 12 hours um, running in our stack yards, which is where, what you see there. That's this part of a stack yard. And all they're doing, similar to some of the other equipment, is moving the boxes around. Um, one thing that's important to know going forward for us, though, is not only do we have 100 hybrid shuttle carriers, or will soon, but we've also got about 100 of these in diesel between the two largest container terminals. So right now, what we're trying to do is evaluate what's the best option for us. Is it to continue down the path of battery electric? Or is it potentially to seek some other sort of fuel source? Maybe it's hydrogen, renewable diesel. There's a variety of other options out there. But in the port industry right now, uh, short of electrifying or powering by battery, those are really uh, the hottest forms of technology that are out there that's being tested. Hydrogen is something that's coming on pretty strong. We are going to keep our finger on the pulse of hydrogen. Hydrogen has the capability to power some of the larger equipment that we have to use for heavier and bigger things. Like when we operate in the rail, for example, some of those containers can be much heavier than containers that go on a truck. And so the real test for these pieces of equipment will be, can they run in the rail for 12 hours? The likelihood of that right now is probably not. But we do know that battery technology is improving. Technology overall in this space is improving. And we know that we will eventually get better. We don't know if with these units we'll be able to make it all the way there uh, and, and be able to run 12 hours in the rail. So what are you left with then? Well, at that point, you're left with basically a mix of technologies to deploy. And so from, luckily, we at the port have a, a fleet manager and, uh, and we work together closely. And so one of his big questions right now is, uh, how much power do we have? How much power do we need? How much power do we need if we electrify all of our equipment or if we need to charge it? Or what other fuels can we get? <clears throat> so we'll move along. Uh, this is really a focus of scope two and our power purchase agreement. So I think there's a lot of folks that think this. We're the only port in the United States that has entered into a power purchase agreement with its power provider. So basically what we've done is we're paying in the rears for solar projects that Dominion has already put out and they're already functioning. Right now we're running on about 69% clean power at all of our facilities. We've got about, um, we have one more solar facility that has to come online uh, and that should be online next year. So that's why we're saying that in 2024, the port's gonna be um, using 100% clean power. Now we're not saying renewable. We almost slipped up. The reason we're not saying renewable is because this <clears throat> all state entities have the capability to participate in a green power plan that Dominion has available for uh, state government entities, even if, uh, even if they're an authority like the Port Authority is. And it guarantees them 10% of this power profile that Dominion has put together. Part of that power profile is nuclear. And so we had to back off the renewable claim. Obviously, nuclear is not renewable. Um, 
it's not renewable and it's a little dirty frankly when you're mining uranium everybody knows that but when you're running on nuclear it runs as clean as wind does and so from a resiliency standpoint and when we start talking about oh my gosh what what if it's cloudy all winter and we don't get any power or i you know we don't have to worry about that because we have uh, a portion of our power portfolio that's built with nuclear. Um, this is one of our more recent CO2 graphs that we put together. Every year we put together um, a sustainability report. We've done it for the past several years. We usually release it on Earth Day. Uh, this year will be no different. This is uh, kind of one of the graphs that typically you'll see in the report, although it'll look a lot better in the report because there was a marketing person that made it look better than the sciencey guy could. Anyway, you'll see the 2017 bar here at the bottom. Like I said earlier, we, <clears throat> we are benchmarking off of 2017. We're benchmarking off of 2017 because we know we have good data to rely on from 2017 that didn't really require a lot of help or cleaning, if you will, to make it good. So you can see from 2017 to 2022, we've had a pretty drastic decrease uh, in CO2. That is largely due to the power purchase agreement that I just talked about, as well as um, the scope one improvements that we've made with the hybrid shuttle car carriers and what we're doing on the UTR side of the house. I mentioned the truck reservation system a little earlier. The truck reservation system uh, is something that we actually, it's software. Um, we started deploying it um, about seven years ago. It became mandatory about mm, five years ago. Truck drivers are required to use it now between certain hours so we can better manage cargo as it uh, flows through the facility. Uh, we have a need to be able to do it uh, not only efficiently but safely too. So <clears throat> I've already talked a little bit about our, our green operator system uh, and our green operator program, but the truck reservation system, when we went back and looked at the emissions that we saved over those hours, um, it was somewhere in between 20 and 22 percent across the board of criteria pollutants. So we knew in the back of our mind if trucks weren't idling on terminal then the emissions would be lower but we didn't know exactly how much lower they would be until we actually did the work and comes uh come to find out it's pretty significant um talked a little bit about the barge already the barge service it's a long-standing program we've had we're considering some things now in which we could look at incentivizing uh, users of the barge. Uh, like I said, uh, we've gone in a, maybe uh, since 2017 from 16,000 to 42,000 containers moving up and down the James River on the barge. And all those moves are less trucks on the road. And one of the other early projects we did was we got a grant to swap out the engines on the tugs that move the barge and we swapped them out with more efficient marine engines. So <clears throat> right out of the gate, as soon as you put that box on the barge, it's about uh, a third of the emissions less than what you're gonna see on the truck. So here's a, here's a big water quality project. I, mean, I haven't talked a lot about water quality. Um, Honestly, over the last year and a half for a lot of ports, decarbonization has really taken a, a front and center stage because of the, the importance of it and the fact that uh, we're trying to gear up to do better. So in the meantime, we have a very small staff. We've got to figure out how do we continue to protect water quality. And one of the ways we're trying to do that is by a shoreline restoration at NIT. NIT is our largest container terminal. It's about a 3,600 foot shoreline that runs along the back of NIT here. 
We're going to pull out old rocks and debris. You guys know what it looks like. Over the years, these industrial facilities, people throw rocks and chunks of concrete and asphalt out on the, on the shoreline to stabilize it. Not only does it not look so great, sometimes some of those things can be not so great for the environment. So we're going to pull some of that out. We're going to replace it with native species. Uh, we're going to put some erosion controls in place to hold everything there. One pretty cool thing you can see on this picture, though, that's not talked about is you can see these shadows down here. Those are actually oyster reefs that are in the system already. Those reefs were installed uh, because they had to be installed. They're actually mitigation reefs. Uh, the mitigation reefs uh, in this particular case were installed because of the work that was being done on a future marine terminal called Craney Island. You guys might know where Craney Island is. It basically sits on the Lizard River. The Army Corps owns it. Uh, it's a dredge disposal site. It kind of looks like a giant sand dune sitting out in the middle of where the Elizabeth River and the James River meet. And uh, we, um, we typically are able to send most of our dredge spoils to that site. So if we have to dredge to get ships in to our terminals, uh, we have to perform typically what's called maintenance dredging. So every once in a while we'll go around and a dredge will come around and they'll dig out all the sediment from where the ships pull up to the port. And that material can typically go to Crane Island. Well, what we thought we would do years ago is we would take that dredge material and we'll build it out into the river to create the next marine terminal. And because we are, or were at that time, impacting the bottom, the bottom of the river, we had to get a permit to do it. We had to apply for a permit from the Army Corps, joint permit application. And they'll say, okay, maybe you can do this, maybe you can't. But at the end of the day, you have to pay for it. You pay for it through mitigation. And that mitigation is to essentially satisfy the impacts that you made when you created the marine terminal. So it's the impacts to marine life on the bottom of the river. That's what these oyster beds are in place for. Many other oyster reefs that we've also put in in the system. There's about seven oyster reefs that we manage uh, and regularly monitor that go towards the mitigation activity for Craney Island. Okay, dredging. Talked a little bit about dredging just now. One of the things I'll mention about dredging is um, not only do we do maintenance dredging, but some of you have probably heard that there's a huge dredging project going on right now um, where the port is essentially making the channel 55 feet deep, which is about five feet deeper than it is now. Um, and they're putting in two passing lanes. So these huge ULCVs that I mentioned earlier can literally pass in the night. And that's not been something that we've had the advantage of here. Uh, so what that means is that the captain of the port at the Coast Guard has to shut down the travel lane, the channel, when we have a ULCV that comes into port. It has to do it when the boat comes in and when the ship leaves as well. What the passing lanes do for us is we no longer have one-way travel once that's complete. We'll have passing lanes on both the east and the west side of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Um, the other, our, just so you know, our two biggest competitors on the east coast, from a volume standpoint, is Savannah and New York, New Jersey. They both have one-way traffic. So this will give us an advantage. Uh, it will allow us to have two-way traffic on either side. It'll also be a big advantage for the Navy, who's been big supporters of the project as well. All right, I know you guys have heard about this one, the wind hub. Everybody has heard about the big offshore wind project off Virginia. Uh, there's others, though, that are that are being developed and permitted as we speak uh, up and down the Atlantic seaboard uh, to really just south of us uh, in North Carolina. 
We, um, we though, <laughs> have been really lucky in that we've been able to negotiate and receive funding for uh, one of our terminals to be transformed into the future wind hub where these offshore wind turbines that you see, the blades, the anchors, everything will be assembled at PMT. PMT is Portsmouth Marine Terminal. It's real close to VIG, Virginia International Gateway, that I talked about a little earlier. But PMT is currently under construction. There's two main lease agreements right now at PMT. One is with Dominion and it's for improvements of the wharf. Essentially, these, these windmills are so big and they're so heavy that <clears throat> we have to basically back a ship in, roll the components off the back of the ship do whatever we have to do to those components and then roll them back on the ship and the ship will be is being built right now by the way and it is big enough to carry enough for three uh, entire units to go into the sea valve project and they'll just keep running in and out until they've completed it um, Siemens Gamesa renewable energy is the other leaseholder Siemens Gamesa is right now in the process of working through permitting for a blade finishing factory there so they can uh, inspect as well as improve and finish the blades that will be carried out on the boat to go on the on the turbines probably uh, we'll be looking on uh, about uh, less than a year now before we get our first receipt of some of what's called green blades those are the blades that have to be refinished um, all right. Some of you guys may have heard of this one. This is uh, this was a great uh, a great class that we participated in with Virginia Wesleyan. Uh, we were approached, and you guys um, really had some great instructors that helped our folks um, at the port learn a little more about the environmental field. And, um, and so what we're trying to do is really just build a basis of knowledge for other folks, because like I said, I only have two other people on my team, and I need as much help as I can get, as you can tell. So it was a great program, and guess what? We're doing it again. So uh, uh, starting again in May this year, we're going to do another round uh, with Virginia Wesleyan, another group of port employees. And we actually had folks this time that they were like, hey, hey, can you put my name on the list? Like, yeah, sure. So I think it's about 25 or so people's what we did last time. Uh, looking, really looking forward to it. And I, unfortunately for the people that are taking the class this time, I'm going to probably have to talk some. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, here's something that I'm sure you guys have heard about, Clean the Bay Day. It's just another example of some of the things we do around the community. Uh, we, oh man, we've been an active participant in Clean the Bay Day for many, many years, uh, well, well before I started. Uh, we usually have a group of somewhere around 50-ish or so people that will come out. We uh, typically will pick some different sites. Sometimes they're on our terminals. Sometimes they're nearby our terminals. Sometimes they're at a partner's facility. And we just go out there and pick up the trash. Uh, but it's a great event. It brings folks uh, together. And you can spend a little bit of time talking about the environmental field and why it's a good thing. So we're getting near the end here. I'm sure you're really disappointed. <laughs> We made this logo. I hope you like it. <clears throat> this is an original logo. Uh, it was in last year's sustainability report. It'll be in this year's sustainability report. It's really what it's doing is uh, emphasizing the UN sustainability goals that the port is committed to. And those goals are, if you, you know, if you're familiar with the UN sustainability goals. Uh, there's many of them, and it's pretty interesting to go look at them online. You, know, you can look up, type in UN Sustainability Goals. 9, 13, and 14 are represented here. 
Nine is technology, and I get the other two backwards. 13 and 14 are air quality and water quality, essentially. So <clears throat> what we're trying to do is focus our actions around these three UN sustainability goals right now. So <clears throat> we, we always try to maintain a focus in those particular three areas. So we're trying to improve water quality, trying to improve air quality, and we're trying to use technology to do those things with. This is the last slide. But I'm not gonna read what's on here. What I'll say is that, uh, number one, thanks. I've certainly appreciated the time. Uh, if anybody here would uh, like to uh, consider touring the port or consider just talking more about the port, the port has um, a lot of folks, about 400 people that I work with and about 2,600 ILA employees. Those are longshoremen, men and women that come out and move the cargo for you guys every day. Uh, we represent uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a third of the workforce touching Virginia. So we make a big economic impact and we also create a lot of jobs. And we're gonna continue to do that, but we're also going to continue to do it in a responsible way. And so with that, I'll thank you. If there's any questions, uh, be happy to answer. No, sir. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because we, uh, I mentioned the shoreline project earlier, and uh, we have a number, well, we're trying to garner a number of partners for that project. One of the big partners is going to be Amazon, and I can now say that. I could not say that a week ago or so. Uh, we're partnering with Amazon on the Shoreline Project, and we hope to partner with others. Um, but as far as the economic impact goes, it was interesting because um, Amazon was kind of on board, on board, on board, and all of a sudden, ooh, some things financially weren't looking quite as good in the economy. And they said, oh, hold on develop an ROI for us for the project. I was like, oh my God, I've never had to do that before. So in 20 years of working in the environmental field, I've never had to develop a return on investment for uh, wetlands plants, or like someone was talking about earlier, was it geese or birds of some sort? It's, um, we haven't done that. What we are doing though is taking the time now to evaluate the infrastructure that we have um, to ensure that these types of projects that we're doing are done with our eyes wide open. We know the infrastructure and we're uh, bringing the right tool to the table, if you will. Uh, so what works at the Port of Virginia might not work at Savannah or New York, New Jersey. Our hybrid shuttle carriers that we use, we worked with Calmar, the manufacturer, hand in hand for five years to tweak them to work for us. And so that's the type of effort that we're putting into this. It's my salary plus two other people's and it's just not something we've had the time to look at. But it's a fascinating question and it's probably one we'll get to sooner rather than later, I suspect. Yeah, thank you. Either, either way. supply support vehicles like ships with all the goods in it. Is there a way to make that 
more eco-friendly? It's funny you mention that. <laughs> so the port doesn't own any ships. There are some ports in the world that own their own harbor craft. So when I say harbor craft, I mean things like tugboats or pilot boats, okay? So the pilots are the guys and gals that go out, they drive a fast boat up to a big ship, and they jump out on a ladder, and it's 40 knot winds, they're hanging on, they climb up the rope, and they drive the ship in middle of the night. That's what the pilots do. The tug guys, you know what tugboats do. <laughs> they maneuver, they position. But a lot of those boats, um, the harbor craft as well as OGVs, ocean going vessels, um, they do what's called hoteling. And hoteling is where you sit there and you burn diesel uh, so your crew can live. So a hoteling is exactly what it sounds like. Your ship becomes a hotel because they have to live there. And so they have lights and their own you know, personal needs and cooking and things because most of the people that are on those cargo vessels really don't get off a whole lot. They might get off when they come in the port, but then they're back on and whoosh, away to the next port. So we don't own boats or the ocean going vessels. But <clears throat> we are interested because um, no matter what port you go to, the number one polluter is always going to be the ocean-going vessel, unless you're at a cruise terminal and then it'll be a cruise ship because hoteling. So um, we're very interested. We have, um, we conduct uh, a number of different studies. We conduct an air emission study about every five years and we uh, recently wrapped up a phase one of our greenhouse gas study, which is looking at those sources of pollution, like harbor craft and ocean going vessels. But since we don't own those boats, they're not scope one emissions, which means we don't have direct control over those. They are scope three emissions though, and that they're in our supply chain likely somewhere or someone doing business with us, they're in their supply chain. So just because it's not a scope three for us doesn't mean it's not scope three for Walmart or Home Depot or Lowe's, any of those big box stores. And so the big message that we've been conveying to a lot of our scope three partners is, hey, look at what we're doing. Here's what we're doing on the scope one and scope two side of the house. Why don't you run your cargo through our facilities? And that starts to generate a buzz in the industry. And uh, when shipping lines start moving across the country and agreeing to move cargo via train from VA to California, that's when people start saying, hang on a minute, what's Virginia doing over there? That actually has happened uh, when, you know, during the pandemic, there's a huge backup of ocean going vessels in California, many, many sitting off the coast. And so there have been some shipping lines that have made an, a, a choice to change, you know, do I drive through the Panama Canal or do I just stop in Virginia and ship everything by rail west? And some have made that choice. The unfortunate thing um, is that the only way that we can make impacts on scope three is by making everybody love us and want to talk to us all the time and finally figuring out that, hey, these guys are actually doing what they say they're doing, number one, and hey, maybe it's not such a bad idea. So there are shipping lines out there that lean a little more forward in the environmental field. CMA, CGM, Maersk, um, there's you know, several others, uh, Oogle. Um, in any case, we've established some partnerships with those folks. We work with them pretty often, really. And um, companies like Maersk, we've partnered with them on uh, emissions monitoring systems for their boats. Um, so, we don't have direct control, but we like to maintain open communications with those folks. So 
hopefully we can make something happen in the future. Yeah, it could, and we don't really, during the pandemic, um, our ILA partners as well as the port staff really didn't fail. We had no days that we were closed. No one ever complained. We came into work, did our jobs, and unloaded the cargo. Um, but I, I really do think that there could be some changes, additional changes coming from the fallout on the west coast a, a year or so ago and what we want to do is position ourselves in virginia to capture that market share and do it responsibly yes ma'am um which project are you most proud of or most excited about oh boy um well i guess i would probably say the hybrid shuttle carriers at least for now because I don't think that there's another port in North America that has completed a full sail equipment line change um, like's represented there. Uh, in my mind, you know, uh, there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of pilot projects going on, but you really have to read and check what folks are doing. Um, and so that's kind of like our evidence that we're, we mean business, we're serious about uh, our claims. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. <laughs> I didn't plant that question. I should have, though. Um, that's a, it's really interesting. It's a great question because um, we're seeing differences. Um, and the difference is that in regards to the hybrid shuttle carriers, <clears throat> we can make our dollars back uh, in about three years from fuel savings. That's really good. That's a really good ROI on a piece of equipment that can really last about 10 years or so. Um, it's not as bright and shiny of a story for the EUTRs, the electric UTRs that I showed you. Um, right now, we only pay about you know, three to four hundred thousand dollars more for the hybrid shuttle carrier than we do a diesel one. Like I said, we make that money back pretty quick. On the EUTR side, um, right now there is not a positive ROI on those, uh, and it probably will not be for a couple years. Uh, I think it's going to take that long for the battery technology to improve to get those particular units to the point where uh, the price really starts dropping on them. The other thing is that um, we're still having supply chain issues. We're still having supply chain issues in the automotive market, uh, as well as um, in other sectors that support the EUTR market, like uh, battery sector, as well as other parts. So we're waiting for some of that stuff to smooth out a little bit. Um, Hopefully, we can get to a point where we have a, a unit that will last eight to 10 years and we have a positive ROI on it. But this could be one of those scenarios in which I talked about earlier where we look for hydrogen uh, as, a, as maybe an alternate solution, maybe. Uh, but it's really just a, a waiting game at this point. <clears throat> Other question? Sure. You said there's a lot of savings from the hybrid vehicles. Why do you think other companies will push back against the transition to Well, earlier I mentioned that a lot of ports are different. Um, they operate differently, but they also have different management setups. 
And I think I mentioned that we're not a landlord port. Maybe I didn't. But we're not a landlord port. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, if you were to go to some other ports in the United States, you might find that they lease an entire wharf at their facility to like a shipping line. So maybe Maersk will lease one wharf. <clears throat> that means then that, um, that all of those emissions are scope three emissions. And those emissions tend to be a little more difficult to tackle if you don't have them in your direct control. Since we're not a landlord port, uh, we're actually operating right on the wharf and we own the equipment. So it's scope one for us. And that means if we can find the money, then we have it fully in our control to make that equipment line change. Now, why folks haven't you know, really realized the benefits of the hybrids, I'm not sure. Um, I think right now what you're seeing in the industry is a, is a strong push to go to electric or batteries. And um, that strong push uh, has, uh, I think, to some degree, slowed down progress because you're not seeing dollars come out of grant funds anymore for hybrid vehicles or hybrid equipment. It's for fully battery, fully electric, um, and that's the administration trying to push that agenda. Um, we at the Port of Virginia have been trying for a while to impress upon some of our legislators that maybe it would be a good idea to almost consider a hybrid as a, as a bridge technology, if you will. Um, a strong push there's to a go lot of to other electric or batteries. And um, with fuel that strong like push can be uh, has, a fuel, or maybe LNG uh, is even a bridge. Fuel. I think. It's something to that some is cleaner, degree, but could be slow better. down progress. And so hybrids, I think, fit into that bill. But right now, you're not seeing dollars being offered up for hybrid equipment anymore. And that's something that's changed within the last two years. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about like wind power and uh, like nuclear and uh, solar for like the different kinds of clean energy. Is the Port of Virginia ever considered like geothermal? So hydro, um, Dominion does actually have a hydro dam, I think, in their portfolio. It's just not a, one I think about typically, but um, we do not um, have any on-site production. So the PPA that I talked about earlier, the power purchase agreement, is considered a virtual PPA and that we're not really constructing solar facilities on port property because we don't have the space for it. Um, we kind of are, are funding the project after it's already been built in the case of solar. And so those, we have one more project left to come online. Uh, geothermal is something we have looked at. Uh, it is still a consideration as we move forward and are in need of doing things like upgrading HVAC systems at some of our facilities. The funny thing is the port doesn't really have a lot of buildings. Uh, we keep it wide open because we can stack boxes there. And that's a lot more valuable than someone sitting in an office. At least that's what somebody thinks. So, so uh, I, uh, I don't, I don't think that you'll see the port doing on-site technologies of that nature. Um, however, we have studied it. Uh, we do know what we could put and where it could be put, and it's it's nothing it's nothing super great. It's rooftop solar, and so you know we have a few facilities where we could deploy rooftop solar. Uh, we could use that and do some craftier things like peak shave, put in battery technology of our own to peak shave with. Um, peak shavings, does everybody know what peak shaving is? Peak shaving is basically when you have the capability 
to run your facility off of another source when the power prices are at the highest during the day. So you save money in the long run that way. Um, I could be wrong, but I think, I think it'll be, you'll see power purchase agreements start cropping up elsewhere. Our inland facility, we also have a 100% um, clean power rider up there. So that facility is funded, um, not funded, it's powered by a different um, power provider. It's Rappahannock Electric Co-op up there and obviously Dominion Power down here. Several times you've mentioned uh, grant money. How, is, how important is that to you all achieving your goals? Oh gosh, we, we take more money than... <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's super important. It, we actually have, um, we're lucky in that we have a grant manager. We apply for so many grants and have been pretty successful over the years um, that we are likely hiring a grant uh, specialist, if you will, soon. And we go after grants that you'll find not only at like the EPA, for example, uh, the DERA grant, but also a lot of DOT grants, Department of Transportation at the federal level. Some of those grants come right out of DOT, and they're pretty big grants. Some of them come out of MARAD, the Maritime Administration. Uh, some of them are pass-through dollars using CMAC funding. Um, but grant funding is super important. It, frankly, I don't know that we ever would have been able to start the hybrid shuttle carrier pilot if we hadn't have gotten that grant. And it was a $750,000 grant that kicked it all off. Yeah. yeah. You talked earlier about being inspired to innovate through looking at other ports in the eastern coast of the US and NLI. Have there ever been any new technologies that the port of Virginia has been inspired by from other countries, such as the EU or Japan? Well, you know, there's a lot of very advanced ports in other countries. Um, some of the ports we'll look at, uh, you know, Beijing, Rotterdam, Hamburg. Um, they're very typically forward-leaning ports. Um, I'll tell you, you know, European ports are a little bit different, especially on the labor side of the house. So you'll see them introduce things like um, automation, for example, in which you can have an entire terminal that just runs with nobody in the vehicle. And it's all by electric circuitry, current software, and it's all tied into the work management system at the port. Um, that's not something that we are really entertaining at the Port of Virginia right now. Um, we value our labor partners. We think that, you know, they're the, the men and the women that are going out really making the effort to move the containers for us to bring us our goods. And, um, and so ILA relationships are something that uh, we really value here in Virginia, the services they provide. Yes, sir. Well, you guys are pretty forward leaning here, I think. I mean, you've got the, man, just a lot of great things going on here. Um, one of the things I offered earlier is that we have an internship program at the Port of Virginia. Obviously, I uh, would love to see you guys apply. Right now, it's closed for this summer, but it opens every summer. We take about 20 to 25 folks. And, um, and it, they really run the gamut of all departments. Um, anything from like terminal operations, if you want to go, you know, see how things really are moving behind the scenes, you know, my department typically has an intern as well as uh, departments like finance and uh, human resources and really runs the gamut. Well, thank you all. It's been a pleasure. I hope you have a safe, safe trip home. And if you have any other port questions, give me a ring. Oh, wow.